welcome to ePurpose Unum's Fireside Chats. Not as good as FDR's, but hey, it's something. So this is my third interview, but it's with a completely different person this time. Arguably a bigger or smaller person. Bigger in the sense that the position he's running for is bigger. Smaller in the sense that he doesn't have his own Wikipedia article. He's not with a major party. I haven't really covered him on a Fireside Chat or a main series video so far. But, you know, you'll learn about him in a second. His social media and website will be right above my stuff in the description. So without further ado, here is 2020 Green Party presidential candidate Ian Schlockman. First of all, who are you to all the people who don't know? So I'm Ian Schlockman from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I've been with the Green Party for about um, six, seven years, I'd say now. Um, uh, I've uh, had a lot of different roles. Within the party, um, I've been everything from a congressional candidate to the governor's candidate to a town ticket, to a city council candidate. Uh, I've also worked on a lot of different campaigns within the party. Worked on a campaign for my good friend, uh, Reverend Annie Chambers, who's now the, the uh, elected Green we have in Maryland. Uh, she's elected to the housing board there. Um, and I'm also a socialist, too. I think even before I was a Green, I was a socialist. There's a lot of socialist organizing. So... Um, I did, um, I've been with almost every socialist organization you can think of, um, started back with the ISO a long time ago, um, left them for organizations that were doing more collaborative work, um, worked a little bit with an organization called Solidarity, uh, which is quite small, and now most recently I worked with, um, Democratic Socialists of America. Um, I do a good amount of organizing with them. I helped run their electoral committee both in Baltimore and on their national electoral committee as well. Um, and I'm just, uh, you know, I'm a young, passionate guy that, that wants to grow the socialist movement in America. I think that um, we have a lot of crises going on in our country right now, and uh, I want to raise some very important issues going into the 2020 election. What was your major inspiration to get into politics? Well... I've always wanted to be in politics. Um, ever since I was young, I had a real interest in it, uh, right out of high school. Um, I, I knew I was a socialist in high school, and I also grew up in a very conservative community. Uh, I grew up in Long Island, New York. And um, I actually was a Democrat for most of my early life, most of my teenage life. Um, I knew a little bit about the Green Party, but there wasn't a big Green Party presence. And I was under the impression that, um, you know, if you had a city or a state run by Democrats, it would look, you know, amazing. It would be like a utopia. Um, long story short, I came to Baltimore <laughs> uh, around uh, 12, 15 years ago, and um, <laughs> uh, it was not a utopia run by Democrats. Uh, it was anything but. And point in time, I started getting more serious about socialism as well. I'd always been sort of an armchair socialist. Um, so I started working with some local on-the-ground organizations in Baltimore, uh, mostly socialist organizations. Some of them were connected to things like Occupy, and stuff like that. Um, but I felt that they had the best critique of what was going on in Baltimore and what was so wrong about it. And it was at that point that I realized that, um, you know, uh, Politics is very corrupt. I mean, you know, I don't, I know it's a very naive statement, but I think it needs to be said. Um, especially local and state politics. Uh, it's, a, it's a really corrupt game, and I think a lot of people treat it like a game. And, you know, for me, I've seen the results of people participating in the game when the players are writing the rules as they go. So, you know, what I mean by that is, if the Democrats are in control of your city, or even the Republicans, and they're not playing fair, and they're writing all the rules, nothing's ever going to improve in your area. And on top of that, there's never really going to be a way to make a solid change in your area. And so that's sort of what I saw in Baltimore and Maryland. And it sort of inspired me to go further um, and ultimately to, to run for national office, to run for president. You supported Dennis Kucinich back in 2008. Why did you then decide to go green? That's a great question. Um, not many people know that I supported Dennis Kucinich. Uh, 
Dennis Kucinich was the last Democrat that I think I supported full, whole, wholeheartedly that I could vote for. Um, so it's been a while since I told the story, so forgive me if it's rusty. Essentially in 2008, um, I, 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 I wanted to vote for Dennis Kucinich, but Dennis Kucinich was off the ballot by the time, well, he was on the ballot, but he, uh, he was backed out of the primary for president before I was allowed to vote for him in Maryland. He told his folks to go, I can't remember if he told his folks to go for Obama or if there was just a consensus to go for Obama. Um, but um, I, I genuinely don't remember if I wound up voting for Obama or not. Um, but I did hear about Jill Stein, and I know that I voted for Jill Stein. Um, I, I just felt that we, no, that, that's actually not true. I want to make sure I get this correct. I think in 2008, I did wind up voting for the Democrat, which would have been Obama. And then I think in 2012, I voted for Jill. I'm not sure. I actually have to get back to you on that. I don't want to give you incorrect information. <laughs> uh, but I, I voted. Um, I can tell you that. But anyway, um... Right, so I think the switch was... So Dennis Kucinich had a really solid anti-war platform. He actually had a platform for a pro-peace force, which I was really... Uh, militarism was so... Anti-militarism was such a big part of my thinking back, especially being a young socialist. And he was the only candidate that even touched it. And even though Obama was definitely seen as a maverick back in 2008, he didn't really didn't really conform to anything anti-military at the time. I mean, he pretty much made it very clear that he was going to continue the war in Afghanistan and stop the one in Iraq. Uh, I didn't feel that was progressive at all. I mean, it, just, it, wasn't, it wasn't socialist, it wasn't progressive, it wasn't anti-war, uh, you know, especially back in 2008. So, um, you know, ever since then, I stuck with the party, because I feel that they're the only party that's committed to anti-imperialism and anti-militarism. And military budget is such a large part of our U.S. budget that I don't feel that we're ever going to tackle any serious crises in America until you get at the heart of the military budget. I, I just feel like it's, it's that, that's where it has to start. So I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into some of my thinking back then. Who are some of your political influences? That's a great question. Um, so... And I guess if you want to talk modern influences, I would have to say, um, I would have to say, uh, Alan Grayson was a really big influence on me. Um, Alan Grayson did a fantastic job of working with more libertarian Republicans to audit the Fed, to work on some issues that on anti-militarism. He did this whole winter soldier type thing, which was a, you know, we did we did a Winter Soldier type thing. I don't know if you're are you familiar with Winter Soldier. Should I explain that for your audience? I I'm familiar with a kind of Winter Soldier. I don't know if we're talking about the same one. I'll, I'll yeah, I'll explain. So like uh, some socialist groups will do this. It's basically an event where you um, reach out to veterans and even active duty military personnel, and uh, you know they call it Winter Soldier versus Summer Soldier because Winter Soldier. It's, you know, the ones that stay behind, the ones that are harder fought, the ones that are in um, the bigger, uh, you know, in in the harder to fight war zone areas uh, versus summer soldiers, which are, you know, different, you know, seen differently. Um, so a winter soldier event is pretty much, you know, you bring in uh, all these folks that tell you really what's happening over there in Iraq, Afghanistan, what they're experiencing, what their life is like, um, and, and, you know, how difficult these wars are, uh, rather than seeing just blind patriotism. Uh, so we did a small winter soldier event in Maryland, uh, with some socialist organizations put together. And I it was pretty, I was working with the Iraq veterans against the war for a little bit. Um, and you mean, Alan Grayson did this massive one up in Capitol Hill where he talked about, you know, drone strikes happening to these poor villagers. And I was really impressed by that. I think that, um, except the independent media outlets, this kind of stuff really wasn't covered. And I just haven't seen, I haven't seen, uh, you know, it's not so much, um, 
being a Democrat or Republican, I'll I'll look at any politician that's actually talking about uh, anti-militarism, that's actually talking about excuse me anti-imperialism and the true cost of of of, of these wars and uh, uh, you know how difficult you know like the like the, the lives lost on both sides you know the human experience on both sides. I think it's um, you know, I give a lot of respect to almost any politician that's that's working that angle, and that's why you know, I mean, there's kind of no contest between uh, Jill Stein and the other presidential candidates that ran um, around that time. So you know, uh, I think that I think it's often overlooked by people. I don't think that they realize that. You know, I hear a lot of Democrats that are just like, oh, just vote Democrat, just because you know, um, it's the logical or you know, politics is a game and you got to play the game kind of thing. I think there's a lot of conscientious objectors out there that just will not vote for um, a party that's going to participate in the war. I think they're only going to vote for a party that's going to say, we're out of Iraq, we're out of Afghanistan now, and we're shutting down military bases. I think that trend's continued, even with Ajama Jama Baraka, who's a strong anti-colonialist, anti-imperialist voice. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of the work that my party's done and, and a lot of the politicians in it. Um, that's sort of what drove me there. Your campaign for Baltimore City Council received the endorsements from Democratic Socialists of America and Socialist Alternative. Should people be concerned that one of them is considered a, quote, far-left Trotskyist group? Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. We, uh, my whole goal is to make sure that there is solidarity among socialist organizations. Uh, I think socialist alternative um, is, although they're Democratic and centralist, um, I don't think that that should disqualify them from being taken seriously. In fact, that I think that they've shown with Kashama Sawant's election and a le- couple of other elections that came really close that they're a political force to be reckoned with, uh, especially in urban areas that have a problem with Democrats just running and winning for decades. So that's a really important model that I want to look at, which is why I went after the Socialist Alternative endorsement. Um, as far as DSA, I mean, DSA has many different kinds of socialists within it, and they all kind of fight it out. <laughs> so it's a very fluid, very interesting organization. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be a part, because I'm happy to lend sort of my knowledge and expertise to some of these younger members that have kind of just coming up, just learning about socialism and what it means. I think that, you know, the the soul of socialism, what it actually means, what it means to be the socialist versus the social democrat is um, a very interesting ever evolving conversation. But again, I want to be clear, you know, my, my goal is to sort of bring more socialist groups together to the table, especially around elections, because uh, I think otherwise we're going to fracture off into this never-ending spiral of smaller and smaller parties. You ran a campaign against Justice Democrat Ben Jealous for Maryland governor. Do you think that your campaign was overshadowed by his? It's a great question. Um, yeah, I do. I'm not going to be, you know, I want to make sure people are understanding that more than anything else, I think people need um, a leader in their presidential candidate that's going to be honest. And I want to be honest answering that question, and I feel that it was. Um, so... I have a tremendous amount of respect for progressive Democrats. I've helped progressive Democrats when I think it makes sense um, when they're fighting the machine. Um, I don't want to comment too much about um, Ben's campaign and things that did right and things that did wrong. Um, but I will say that um, I think there was a lot of socialist energy that just got squandered. Um, he said some pretty negative things about socialists. I know a lot of people weren't happy about. And I think there are a good amount of socialists within the progressive democratic wing of the party. Um, So, you know, that's sort of inside baseball for those that really keep up with politics. But I I do think it affected the campaign because we we wanted to keep the campaign about the issues. And more and more things came up about um, both candidates that were personal. You know, the Republican... Uh, had some scandals come at the last minute, and so did Ben. And, you know, this was difficult because we just continued to do an uh, honest campaign that was issue-based, 
you know, and if it didn't win, it would so be it. I mean, we weren't going to go into this scandal territory calling out people. We felt that there were a lot of very important issues, especially around the Baltimore area, that were just totally unaddressed. And we did our hardest to make sure that um, those issues got some notice at the end of the campaign. I mean, you know, we're still out there today. We still have a a, a radio show, a Reverend Chambers, my running mate and myself, and we're still trying to get those issues out of the table. You know, um, I know it's very, very specific to Baltimore, but Baltimore has a massive violence problem. Over 300 homicides last year. It's a very small city, constantly on the decline. And the mayor thinks that the best way to increase um, uh, residents in the city is to do typical neoliberal stuff, like, you know, give Amazon massive handouts uh, to come into Baltimore, you know, tear down public housing for people that can't afford to live there, and do tax incentives for wealthy uh, condominiums. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense, and there's not a lot of difference between that strategy and the strategy of a Republican. So, uh, you know, I think the, I, I, you know, all I could do is try my best to continue to spread the message that I think you need a radical progressive, a radical socialist platform, especially in cities like Baltimore where I live. Otherwise, if you just keep pounding the same drum of economic progress through venture capitalists and through according to companies like Amazon, I mean, I think you're seeing the results of that right now in cities like Baltimore and Chicago and other areas across the country. What inspired you to pull a Richard Ojeda and run for the presidency after losing a big race? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I don't see another candidate like myself, even amongst the Greens. Um, I have a very unique relationship with the socialists. I am a socialist, and I've been a socialist for a long time. And I, uh, you know, I... I, I think that there are multiple crises that are facing this country, and I don't think either party, Democrat or Republican, are able to tackle them in a way that makes any kind of logical sense. I think when you keep the label of capitalism, I think when you keep the economic paradigm of capitalism alive, you know, if you say everything has to be done in this certain economic way because we're capitalists, we're a capitalist country, that you're never going to have enough money on the table to make sure that, you know, we're taking care of major crises. You're talking poverty, generational poverty. I think that's starting with the millennials and it's going to last a long time. Um, you know, and certain groups have never seen the lift out of poverty. We have that in Baltimore. We have that all over Maryland uh, and all over the country. I think you're seeing economic, uh, environmental crises and economic crises that are just never before have been like this. Uh, the same thing with international relationships. So if you look at relations with China um, and the EU itself. So I think that it's time for a different perspective on... Um, I, I don't want this to be a campaign about specific policies. I am a very big supporter of, one, a universal basic income. Um, and I, I do want to make sure that, that gets into the message of the campaign. But beyond that, I want to make sure that this is focused on a systemic change in the U.S., and I'm not sure if any other candidate's going to bring that to the table. So that's, that's why I wanted to run. You spoke briefly about your platform. Can you give some more in-depth positions for those who might want to vote for you? Yeah, sure. So um, it's, it's very early on, and um, we're still hammering out some more policy positions. I want to be really clear about that. Um, at this point, I know that we want to make sure that certain policies are definitely on the table, but we want to frame them in a different way that's been before. So, you know, for example, we want to tackle the student debt crisis. But we want to tackle it in a way that we talk directly about debt relief and uh, 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 the actual um, elimination of the student debt, you know, sort of a, a, a debt jubilee, if you will. We want to actually talk about, you know, canceling these debts. And I think that the only way to phrase that, to you know, to not just say you're spending money like crazy, is to frame it through a socialist framework. I think that's really important. It's so important to say that you know, in this country, we have infinite amount of money for war, 
and we get, for some reason, whenever it comes to issues of social justice, economic justice, uh, you know, student loan issues, uh, universal basic income, we just never find the money on the table. So I don't think, I think that the capitalist framework is sort of, you know, keeping our hands tied uh, behind our back. And I want to start exploring some different avenues for tackling these really important issues. So, you know, I mean, I think if you look at some of the things that I've always talked about, you know, I, I, one of the things I made really uh, front and center in my last campaign was an anti-poverty platform, literally abolishing poverty. How would we actually abolish poverty um, in Maryland and, 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 and statewide and, and, and nationally, um, you know, using the resources at our disposal, using the policies at hand? So we're talking a basic income, we're talking a jobs guarantee, uh, and we're talking state banks, and we're also talking universal health care, um, you know, along with a lot of other down-ticket policies as well. I don't, if you don't frame it, if you just focus on the policy, if you don't frame it as a plan to abolish poverty, then I think that you're going to get lost in the weeds. You know, you could have a situation where we get a small universal basic income and we still have massive amounts of poverty. We could have universal health care. Other countries have universal health care. They haven't abolished poverty. So we want to frame things a little bit differently. So, you know, this is going to take some time. Um, we are thinking about crowdsourcing some of our platform as well. We've been asked by some of our uh, supporters about that because I want to make sure people get that it's about the framing of it. It's not about the individual policies themselves. Although, you know, we'd all be excited to see universal basic income or universal health care, but it's not done right and for specific goals. It's not going to really go where it wanted to go. Let's get this question out of the way. Why not just run as a Democrat and get the stuff done from the inside? So, I mean, that's a really easy question. Uh, I'm not a Democrat. It's as simple as that. Um, there's nothing else for me to really say about that topic. Um, you know, uh, I've had some really wonderful conversations with some Democrats that uh, I know are, um, you know, uh, you know, friends of mine, let's say that. But, I mean, ultimately, at the end of the day, uh, that party is not really interested in uh, working with the, the Green Party at all. There's just no way around that. Uh, you know, the best example of this is my 2018 election, which was, you know, a race for governor. Uh, I, am, I am very well known within the Green Party for not wanting to run a ticket uh, because I don't think the Greens should be, um, you know, I think that uh, the Green Party candidate that runs top of the ticket has a responsibility to grow the Green Party, not necessarily make it about them and their issues. Um, you might find that a little weird for me to be saying, but I, 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 you know, I mean it. Uh, I think it's to, to keep that at the forefront when we're thinking about running for office. So I ran for office in 2018 for the governor's race because we had to, because the Green Party actually had to run someone and try to get 1% in that election. And if we didn't run someone, we risked that we risk lose, uh, losing ballot access. And now we have to go back and do petitions to stay on the ballot. So, I mean, often the Democrats write these laws. I mean, Democrats are fully in control here in Maryland. They could have written a different law that said, you know, um, here's different ways to stay on the ballot, or here's rules for third parties that make it they don't have to run in the governor's race. But they don't. I mean, they write the law. They write the law that says you have to run top of the ticket, and then when we run top of the ticket, they get mad at us. I think there are some really good progressives within the Democratic Party that mean well, but they've got to get control of their own party because, I mean, the folks writing the laws and the folks that are the big bosses, uh, whether you're in Annapolis in my state or whether it's Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer in D.C., are not our friends. I mean, they're just not. I mean, you might be the friendliest person with the progressive in your local hometown, but really... Are they going to challenge their boss? Are they going to challenge the mayor of the hometown? Are they going to challenge their boss in the state capitol? Are they going to actually put progressive agendas on the table? I'm not seeing it. I'm seeing capitulation after capitulation. And I just feel like we're not going to get anywhere as a country if we keep kowtowing back to political bosses, whether it's on the Democrat side or the Republican side. Why do you think you should be the Green Party nominee as opposed to someone like Sydenham? Someone like who? Someone like Sydenham, who is a woman also running for the Green oh. Party nomination. Yeah, sure. That, that, that's a good question. Um, so I think my work 
sort of speaks for itself. Um, I think I've done a lot of work outside of the Green Party, particularly. So, I mean, one of the, my goals of the Green Party is to align the Green Party more with, uh, with, 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 with socialists that are interested in running for office. I think that the Green Party is, is we are officially eco-socialist now, but I don't think we get our advantage. A lot of the things that we talk about from the Green Party, such as the Green New Deal, such as basic income, um, such as uh, environmental justice issues, we don't, frame, we don't frame it back to socialism. And I think that's something I really want to focus on in my campaign. Uh, you know, why a socialist agenda makes more sense, especially an eco-socialist agenda, and turning our party into a more uh, robust socialist party where socialists of all stripes run and do political organizing. You know, the goal of, well, for me anyway, the goal of socialism is to raise class consciousness. You want to make sure that people, no matter how poor they are, no matter how unemployed they are, or no matter how well off they are, uh, have the ability to advocate for themselves. They need to know that they can stand up for better public housing. They need to know that they can stand up for a basic income. They need to know that they can stand up for universal health care. And I don't see um, the major two parties doing that at all. I see the Green Party actually going out there and doing, like, we're actually organizing the Green Party in Baltimore uh, within Douglas Homes, within, like, a small housing project in Baltimore City. Like, that's fantastic and amazing work that we're doing down there. And I was proud to help down that work. Um, you know, so I think that... Um, I think that if you look, if you, I feel that I'm the best choice because I'm familiar with, familiar with going into communities that have been completely neglected by both major parties and, you know, empowering them with political demands that they can then go make right back at their mayor's office or their city councilor's office. So that's what I've been doing for the past, I don't know, eight, ten years in Baltimore, and I'm ready to take that national. And I, to me, that, that socialism, but, you know, you can call it whatever you want. But to me, that's what socialism is, and that's why I also want to make sure that socialists feel right at home within the Green Party and the organizing work that we're doing. I know it may be a bit too early to say, but if you won the Green Party nomination, who would you consider as a running mate? <sighs> well, if I had my pick, uh, I would pick um, uh, my, uh, my, my dear friend uh, right here in Baltimore, Reverend Annie Chambers. Um, she is a solid green... Um, she is an uh, uh, elected official in Baltimore City, and, you know, she's a former Black Panther. Oh, she always gets me when I say that. She always says it's not such a thing as a former Black Panther. Uh, she, she's, a, she's a Black Panther uh, who's never sold out, who's still down there doing amazing organizing work, still causing a ruckus in Baltimore City, um, still trying to get justice for the people of her community. Um, uh, you know, I think Green Party needs to attract people like that, people that have been um, ignored by traditional politics for decades. You know, this woman did organizing work on the Eastern Shore, getting shot at by white nationalists and Ku Klux Klan members. Um, you know, uh, uh, she's, uh, she's, um, she's trained under Malcolm X himself and uh, worked with Martin Luther King. And, you know, because she'll go down to City Hall and cause a fuss, and, you know, yell at them when they're shutting down public housing and doesn't get along with the Democrats. In fact, she famously wants a Democrat that was trying to cut uh, food services in Baltimore City, a mayor, she actually <laughs> tricked him into eating dog food at one point um, <laughs> to show him what it's like to be a poor person. And, you know, um, obviously her relationship with the Democratic Party has never been the same since then. So I, I, I think we got to do our best to attract more folks that are, you know, causing a ruckus and raising important issues uh, by just not getting the attention all over the country. And I think Reverend Chambers is a good example of that. So that's, you know, <laughs> if, if I have my pick, that's who I choose. Um, she told me that's off the table, though. So, uh, you know, at this point, we are, we are looking at, at all options. I think uh, sort of another interesting tidbit about the Green Party is we, we've had a lot of success last cycle. I just don't think it's through election victories. So, I mean, we've had a lot of young people for office, uh, whether it's Elijah Manley in Florida or it's uh, Kenneth Miha out in the West Coast with a couple other folks out there. Uh, you know, and I think, uh, um, you know, a lot of them are getting, getting some notoriety, but <laughs> they're all under 35 years old, and you've got to be at least 35 to run for office. I just happen to be this... Um, this great age where I'm currently 34, will be 35 in December, 
And um, yeah, that, you know, that was another reason I really wanted to run. I wanted to show that younger people, the kind of people that were attracted to the Green Party, uh, can run for office and raise some really important issues. So, I mean, um, it's to be seen. You know, um, there are some rules for picking someone as a VP that we have to stay by. So, um, to be seen. I'm not, I don't have any other answers for you yet except for that. If you don't get the Green Party nomination, will you fully support whoever does? Yes, yes. I think the Green Party is the is the is the one. Um, every, everyone that I've ever run with in the Green Party, um, uh, you know, people that have run um, in, in different parts of the state. When I ran for governor, people that I work with in the Green Party um, in the um, uh, when I was the uh, co-chair of the Green Party in Maryland. Uh, people that I work with in the national. I mean, uh, they're 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 great, hardworking people. I mean, uh, it would be very hard for me to think of someone that I wouldn't support. Um, I think the Green Party, party, and people don't really realize this. Um, we actually can make sure that, that our candidates are fully vetted to a certain degree. Uh, maybe not so much when it comes to the presidential race, although there are some thresholds that the presidential um, Green Party committee. Uh, will throw out there. You know, you have to raise a certain amount of funds in certain areas of the country. You have to um, show that you're a serious candidate. You have to, you know, come to the convention and stuff like that. So, I mean, uh, you know, and those aren't the criteria. They haven't listed the criteria yet, but I'm sure they'll do a good job of of putting it there. So, I mean, um, you know, and part of what we do in Maryland is we do ask candidates, you know, are you committed to the 10 key values of the Green Party? Are you committed to making sure that, you know, you, you, you actually are a member and that, you know, you're going to uphold our values? So because of that, I feel really strongly that um, we'll take a really good candidate no matter who it is. I hope it's me, but I, don't, I can't imagine a scenario where I wouldn't be able to back the candidate. What if Donald Trump was the candidate? What if Donald Trump was the candidate? For the Green Party? What if he decided? Uh, no, I wouldn't. I would say that the Green Party would have an interest if they allowed him to be the candidate. That uh, would be, uh, I'd be the first person to, to leave the party in that case. I promise you that. That would be insane. Aside from the Green Party, are there any other parties that you're considering the nominations for? For example, like when Jill Stein ran for the Peace and Freedom nomination as well? Um, yes. Um, I can't go into it too much, but there are some smaller socialist parties that usually run a candidate um, if they don't align with the Green Party candidate. And I, I do want to make it my goal to make sure that most uh, 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 parties that they can get behind and a candidate they can get behind. It's a big part of my thinking on this. I, I do a lot of work with different kind of uh, on-the-ground organizing groups here in Maryland and in Baltimore, and a couple that are regional uh, on the East Coast. And I want to make sure we expand on that and make sure that we are showing, uh, you know, grassroots groups that are actually work of uh, organizing folks on the ground that this is a campaign that they could be proud of and, and that they want to associate themselves with. And that's why I have a history of doing that. I mean, I mean, when I got, I didn't just get uh, uh, Social Alternatives and the DSA's nomination in 2016, uh, I also worked with uh, uh, some other groups as well, like Workers, I'm saying that right? People's Power Assembly, um, you know, and a couple other socialist groups in Baltimore. Uh, and we did like sound cars together and stuff like that. So, I mean, you know, I think we, we really have to show solidarity out there on the streets. Um, and, you know, the more we try to go at this alone, um, as just the Green Party, I don't think we're going to be able to, to win it. I think we, we've got to show solidarity with frontline communities and uh, activists on the ground. And that means, you know, coming to them, making asks of them, and then working with them to show that we're the candidate. Now, if a Democrat aligns with you politically perfectly, would you stay in the race against that Democrat, or would you drop out? That's a great question. I mean, I think that, um, you know... <laughs> Uh, I'll give you an example of that to, to do you one better. Like when I'm, I, I'm on the, I'm, I'm one of the co-founders of a nonprofit um, that focuses on the basic income, basic income action. And um, you know, when Andrew Yang announced that he was going to run for president with the all basic income platform, I was like, wow, I was really taken aback. And his platform is outstanding, very, very thorough. 
Um, he's obviously not a socialist. Um, so, you know, there are some differences there. But um, my thought on this is kind of twofold. And let me make sure I say this right. If someone like that actually got the Democratic nomination, I think it would show that the Democratic Party is in a very different place. And I'd say, not as a Green Party member, not as a socialist, but as a person on Earth, I would be very happy if that actually happened. Uh, I think that would show tremendous growth uh, of, of us as a country. Because one of the two major parties actually changed uh, and took their responsibility a little more seriously uh, to solve the challenges that we're facing. Now, that being said, I don't have any faith in that at all. I just don't. Um, if you work with Democrats at the state level or at the city level at all, I mean, you'll realize there are so many corrupt Democrats out there, and they play games that are on other level than what you're thinking. I mean, they, you know, we've had Democrats in Baltimore City, when they don't agree with um, city council people, the city council president will strip them of all committee responsibilities in the council. They literally won't be able to put a bill forward, won't be able to pick up a phone without getting hung up on. I mean, it's another level of political gamesmanship that I don't think everyday people understand. I think there's still this hope that a white knight will swoop through the Democratic Party and fix everything. And I'd love to see it happen, but I'm not holding my breath for that. So I don't think that'll be a scenario that has to, uh, that we have to deal with. Um, the other thing I want to say about this is that, you know, the Democratic Party would have to do a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work, to divorce itself from its imperialist, pro-military, pro-colonialist uh, 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 roots. And it hasn't done any of that work. I mean, I just don't think it's there at all. There are people on the ground in Baltimore that I talk to and say, oh, you know, are you a Democrat? And they say, you know, F no, you know, that's the party that was pro-slavery. I would never vote Democrat. My dad never voted Democrat. My grandfather never voted Democrat. I'm never voting Democrat a day in my life. So, I mean, if that's something that party wants to address head on, feel free to do so. But I'm not seeing that as a strong opposition uh, to when I run. Um, in fact, I think that um, <clears throat> one of our key goals in this race is to make sure if you're a non-voter and you feel like none of the parties rec represent you, we want you, we want to talk to you, we want to work with you, we want this to be your party. Uh, that's really important to us. Other parties have just sort of let, frankly, the poor, uh, I think, are the biggest recipients of this. I mean, if you talk to a political consultant, they'll tell you straight up, um, you know, don't bother trying to get poor people to vote because they have a really hard time voting. Almost as hard a time as students, almost as hard a time as millennials, almost the hardest, and, and you know, the hardest one is homeless people. Well, that's what we do. I mean, we go to people that are not registered to vote, that say that they feel like the two parties have abandoned them, that they don't feel like they're going to get anywhere at either party, and we make sure they know that they have a political home in the Green Party. So, I mean, oh, that's a, that's a pretty high bar, and it's something that we're doing in the Green Party that I just don't think any other party is working on at all. I mean, even candidates that I like, I think, are working on winning primary after primary in their race for, uh, for the Democrats. And I just don't see that as coalescing or gelling with the on-the-ground work you have to do to empower people that have just been left behind by the political process. If this presidency thing doesn't work out, do you plan on running for another political office? Yes, absolutely, yes. I'm 100% committed to, to my own advice. I think that we, our biggest power in the Green Party is working with uh, locals on the ground that are doing the organizing and then actually running for local office. Um, you know, when I lost my 2016 race for city council, I said, okay, we got to go smaller. And we came back and uh, Reverend Chambers uh, was running to represent her um, public housing community and we got her elected. So it's about, you know, properly, that's one of the reasons that I wanted to run as well is because, um, sort of to go back to your question about, um, you know, why run after the governor's race? You know, I've experienced what it's like to run when um, you are sort of outshadowed by what's happening on the Democratic stage. Um, and I think that the answer, the anecdote to that would be, the, the antidote to that would be uh, actually focusing on communities that are just not getting any attention from the Democratic Party at all. 
And, you know, those are people that don't vote. They're people that are in poor communities, people that are losing their housing. Excuse me. Um, so I feel that, uh, you know, it, it organizing in communities that have been neglected and then actually running for office um, in down ticket races like city council or even smaller like water boards, park boards, utility boards, that kind of thing is, is a key component. And as long as I'm, um, if I, if I, you know, get the Green Party's uh, nomination, it's something that I intend to focus on. I will be focusing on making sure that down ticket candidates that have an actual chance of winning in the Green Party and, you know, the communities they represent or seeking to represent are the ones that we focus on, not my own race. Um, I, I don't feel that that's, my own race is not as important as the races that are winnable down ticket with the Greens. So, yeah, I, I'm definitely going to run for something smaller as soon as this is over. Well, thanks for being on my show. Before I let you go, is there anything else you want to say? Uh, no, check out my website. Uh, check out my website, schlackman.com. Uh, we just put up our plan for the Green Party that I think reflects some of the things we're talking about today, as well as some things uh, on the blog there, too. Uh, we're talking about Trump's uh, border wall and the government shutdown a little bit. And, you know, comparing, I think we're the only candidate out there that's actually saying, you know, um, making sure that asylum seekers and refugees actually get a fair shot uh, of coming into this country and we open the borders to them is incredibly important. And I think with only party is going to talk about that too. So I, I strongly encourage people to check out the website. Um, and uh, I really appreciate you having me on. Great. I may not vote for you in the primary, but if you make it to the general and a progressive Democrat doesn't win, I'll vote for you then. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll take what I could get. <laughs> appreciate it.